Welcome to my channel. There's my little kitty cat. Welcome to my channel. We are reading Little Women by Louisa M. Alcott. If I'm saying that right, I'm sorry. Um, and we are going to be on chapter 18. Um, and I'm just going to start reading it. Chapter 18, Dark Days. Beth did have, did have the fever. And it was much sicker. I'm just gonna read. Hold on one second. Beth did have the fever and was much sicker than anyone but Hannah. And the doctor suspected. The girls knew nothing about illness, and Mr. Lawrence was not allowed to see her. So Hannah had everything, um, everything her own way. And Dr. Bangs did his best, but left a good deal to the excellent nurse. Meg stayed at home lest she should affect the kings and kept house feeling very anxious and a little guilty. When she wrote letters in which no mention she made, made of Beth illness, she could not think it right to de deceive her mother. But Hannah wouldn't hear of Miss March being told and worried just for the trifle. Jo devoted herself to Beth day and night. Not a hard task for Beth. Was very patient and bore her pain uncomplainingly. But there came a time when during the fever fits, she began to talk in a hoarse, broken voice to play on the converlet uh, as if her beloved little piano and try to sing with a, so a throat so swollen that there was no music left. A time when she did not know the familiar faces uh, around her, but addressed them by wrong names and called importantly for her mother, then Joe grew frightened frightened meg begged to be allowed to write the truth and even hannah said she would think of it though there was no danger yet a letter from washington added to their trouble for miss mark mr march and had had to relapse a relapse and could not think of coming home for a while, a long while. How dark the days seemed now, and how heavy were the hearts of the sisters as they worked and waited while the shadow of death hovered. Hovered over in one happy home. Then it was the Margaret sitting alone with tears dropping often on her work. Felt how rich she had been and things more precious than a luxury's money could buy. Then it was that Joe living in the darkened room with the suffering little sister learned to see the beauty of Beth's nature. To feel how deep a place she filled in all hearts and to acknowledge the worth of Beth's unselfishness, ambitious uh, to live for others and make home happy by the exercise of those simple virtues, which all may possess and which all should value more than talent, wealth, or beauty. And Amy and her excel longed eagerly to be at home, and she might work for Beth. Feeling now that there, uh, that no service would be irksome, Lori haunted the house like the restless ghost, and Mr. Lawrence locked the grand piano beauty. He could not bear to be reminded of the young neighbor who used to make the twilight pleasant for him. Everyone missed Beth, the milkman, baker, grocer, and the butch uh, butcher inquired how she did poor. Mr. Hummel uh, came to beg pardon for her thoughtlessness 
and to get a shrewd for Minna. The neighbors sent all sort of comforts and good wishes, and even those who knew her best were surprised to find how many friends shy little Beth had made. Meanwhile, she lay on her bed with old Jonah at her side, for even in her wanderings, she did not forget the forlorn uh, prodigy. In her quiet hours, she was full of anxiety about Joe. She sent loving messages to Amy, bade them tell her mother that she would write soon, and often begged for pencil and paper to try say try to say a word that father might not think she had neglected him. But soon even these inner rails of consciousness ended, and she lie hours after hour tossing to the fro with incurrent words on her lips or sank into a heavy sleep which brought her no refreshment. Dr. Bangs came twice a day. Hannah sat up, uh, sat up all night. Meg kept a telegram at in her desk all ready to send off at any moment and Joe never stirred from Beth's side. The first of December was a winch, uh, wintry day indeed to them for a bitter wind blew, snow fell fast and the year seemed gr getting, oh my god, the year seemed getting ready for its death. Dr. Bangs came that morning. He looked long at Beth, held the hot hand in both of his Oh my gosh. In both of his own a minute and laid it gently down, saying in the low tone to Hannah, If Miss March can leave her husband, she'd better be sent for. Hannah nodded without speaking, for her lips twitched nervously. Meg dropped down into the chair and strengthened, seemed to go out of her limbs at the sound of those words. And Joe, after standing with a pale face for a minute, ran to the parlor, snatched up the telegram, and throwing her own things, rushed out into the storm. She was soon back, and while noiselessly taking off her cloak, Lori came in with a letter saying that Mr. March was mending again. Joe read it, thankfully, but her heavy weight did not seem lifted off of her heart. And her face was so full of misery that Lori asked quickly, What is it? Is Beth worse? I've sent for mother, said Joe, tugging for her rubber boots with a tranquilly expression. Good for you, Joe. Did you do it on your own? Responsible? Res oh my gosh. Responsibility? Asked Lori as he sat her in the hall's chair and took off the rubbish boots Seeing how her hands shook, no, the doctor told us to. Oh, Joe, it's not so bad as that, Lori. Yes, it is. She doesn't know us. She don't look like my Beth, and there's nobody to help us bear it. Mother and father both gone, and God seems so far away. I can't find him. As the tears streamed fast down poor Joe's face, she stretched out her hand as if groping in the dark. And, oh my gosh, in the dark. And Lori took it in his whispering with a lump of his throat. I'm here. Hold on to me, Joe, dear. She could not speak what she did. Hold. And the warm grasp of her friendly human hand comforted her sore heart. Lori longed to say something tender and comfortable, but no fitting words came to him. So he stood silent, gentle stroking her bent head. It was the best thing he could have done, far more soothing than the most equivalent words, for Joe felt the unspoken symphony, and in the silence learned the sweet solace which affection administrators to sorrow. Thank you, Teddy. I'm better now. I don't feel so forlorn. 
and we'll try to bear it if I, it comes. Keep hoping for the best. That will help you lots, Joe. Soon your mother will be here and then everything will be right. I'm so glad father is better now. She won't feel so bad about leaving him. Oh me, it does seem as if all the troubles come in a heap and got the heaviest part on my shoulders, sighed Joe. Poor girl, you worn out. Stop a bit. I'll, I'll hearten you up in a jiffy. <sighs> Lori went off to stairs at the at a time, and Joe laid her wor oh, worried her face down on Beth's little brown hood, which no one had thought of moving from the table where she had left it. It must have possessed some magic, for the submissive spirit of its gentle owner seemed to enter into Joe. And when Lori came running down with the glass of wine, she took it with a smile and said bravely, I drink healthy to my Beth. You are a good doctor, Teddy, and such a comfortable friend. How can I ever pay you? I'll send you, I'll send, um, I'll send in my bill by and by. And tonight, I'll give you something that will warm the cloaks of your heart. Better than quarts of wine, said Lori. What is it? cried Joe. I telegraphed to your mother yesterday, and Brooke yet answered. She'd come at once, and she'll be here tonight, and everything will be all right. Lori spoke very fast and turned red and excited all in a minute, for he had kept his plot a secret. For fear of disappointing the girls or harming Beth, Joe grew quite white, flew out of her chair, and the moment he stopped speaking, she electrified him by throwing her arms around his neck and crying out, Oh, Lori, oh, mother, I am so glad. She did not weeping again, but laughing um, hysterically and trembled and clung to her friends as if she was a little bewildered by the sudden news. Lori, though decidedly amazed, behaved with great presence of mind. He patted her back soothingly and, finding that she was recovering, followed it up by the bashful kiss or two, which brought Joe round at once. Holding on to the banisters, she put him gently away, saying bre uh, breathlessly, Oh, don't. I didn't mean to. It was dreadful of me, but you were such a good dear to go and do it, in spite of Hannah, that I couldn't keep flying at you. Tell me all about it, and don't give me wine again. It makes me act so. I don't mind. Laughed Lori as he settled his tie. Why, you see, I fidgetly, and so did Grandpa. We thought Hannah was overdoing the authority business, and your mother ought to know. She never forgave us if Beth, well, if anything happened to you. So, I got Grandpa to say it was high time we did something, and all I pleaded to the office yesterday, for the doctor looked sober, and Hannah most took my head off when the pro proposed of the telegram, your mother will cut my note, and the train is in 2 a.m., I shall go for her, and you've only got to bottle up your rapture. And keep Beth quiet till the blessed lady gets here. Lori, you're an angel. How shall I ever thank you? Fly at me again, and I rather like it, said Lori, looking mischievous. No, thank you. I'll do it by proxing. When your grandpa comes, don't tease, but go home and rest, for you'll be up half the night. Bless you, Teddy. Bless you. That's a... Interfreitest chap I've ever seen, but I forgive him and do hope Miss March is coming on right away, said Hannah with an air of relief when Joe told the good news. Meg had a quiet rapture while Joe set the sick room in order, and Hannah knocked up the couple of pies in case of the company unexpected. A breath of fresh air seemed to blow through the house and something better of sunlight brightened the quiet rooms 
everything up here to feel the hopeful change. The best bird began to chirp again, and the half-blown rose was discovered of Amy's bush on the window. The fire seemed to burn with unusual cheer cheeriness, and every time a girl met, their pale face broke into smiles as they hugged one another, whispering encouragingly, Mother's coming, dear. Mother's coming. Everyone rejoiced, but Beth, she lie in that heavy s supper, alike unconscious of hope and joy. It was a piteous sight, and once rosy face so changed, the vacant, the only busy hands so weak and wasted. The one smiling lips, quiet, dumb, and once pretty, well kept her hair scattered, rough and tangled on the pillow. All she, all day she lies so, only rose now and then to a mutter, water, with lips so parched they could hardly shape the word. All day Joe and May hovered over her, watching, waiting, hoping, and trusting in God and Mother, and all day the snow fell. The bitter wind raged, and the hours dra uh, dragged slowly by. But night came at last, and every time the clock struck, the sister still sitting on either side of the bed looked at each other with brightened eyes for each hour brought healthy nearer. The doctor had been in to say that some change for the bitter or worse would probably take place about the midnight at which time he would return. Hannah quit, uh, quiet, worn out, lay on the sofa at the bed's foot and fell fast asleep. Mr. Lawrence marched to and fro in the parlor, feeling that he would he would rather face a rebel battery than Miss March's anxious uh, contingents. As she entered, Lori lay on the rug, pretending to rest. The girls never forgot that night, for no sleep came to them as they kept their watch. Oh, God, spare Beth. I never will complain again, whispered Meg earnestly. If God spares Beth, I'll try to love and serve him all my life, answered Joe with equal f favor. Fervor. Um, here the clock struck twelve and both forgot themselves in watching Beth, for they fancied and change passed over her wan face. The house was still as death, worry Hannah slept on, and no one but the sisters saw the pale shadow, which seemed to fall upon the little bed. An hour went by, and nothing happened except Lori's quiet departure for the station. Another hour, still no one came, and the anxious fear of delay of the storm, or accidents, by the way, or worst of all, the great grief of Washington haunted the poor girls. It was, it was past two when Joe, who stood in the window, heard the movement by the bed, and turned quickly, saw Meg kneeling before her mother's ease chair. With her face hidden, the dreadful fear passed coldly over Joe as she thought Beth is dead, and Meg is afraid to tell me. She was back to her post in an instant, and her excited eyes, a great change seemed to have taken place. The fever flushed and the look of pain were gone and beloved little no desire to weep and lament. Leaning low over this dearest of her sisters, she kissed the damp forehead and soft whispered, Goodbye, my Beth. Goodbye. As if wakened by the stir, Hannah started out of her sleep, hurried to the bed, looking for Beth, felt her hands listen at her lips, and then throwing her apron over her head, and sat down to the rock in the fro, exclaiming, 
the fever turned and she's sleeping natural. Her skin damp and her breaths easily. Praise be given. Oh my goodness me, before the girls could believe the happy truth, the doctor came to confirm it. Yes, my dear. I... Yes, my dear. I think the little girl will pull through. Keep the house quiet. Let her sleep. And when she wakes, give her give her what they were to give neither heard for both crept into the dark hall. And sitting on the cha uh, stairs, held each other's close, rejoicing with heart too full of words when they went back to be kissed and cuddled by faithful Hannah. They found Beth lying, as she used to do, with her cheeks plowed in her hands and dreadful parlor gone, and breathing quietly as if just fallen asleep. If mother would... If mother only comes now, said Joe. See, said Meg, coming up from... Coming up with a white half-opened rose... I thought this would heart, hardly be ready to lie in Beth's hands tomorrow if she went away from us. But it has blossomed in the night, and now I mean to put it in my vase here so that when the darling wakes, the first thing she sees will be little Rose and Mother's face. Never had the sun risen so beautifully. And never had the world seemed so lovely as it did to the heavy eyes of Meg and Joe as they looked out in the early morning when their long and vile was done. It looked like a fairy world, said Meg, smiling to herself, and she stood behind the curtain watching the daisy sight. Hark, cried Joe, started with her feet. Yes, there was a sound of bells at the door. Below, a cry from Hannah, and then Lori's voice saying in the joyful whisper, Girl, she comes! Alright, I'm going to do chapter 19 as well, guys. Chapter 19, Amy's Will. While these things were happening at home, Amy was having hard times at Aunt March's. She felt her exceed deeply, and for the first time in her life, realizing how much she was beloved and petted at home. Aunt March will never repeat it anyone, but she meant to be kind for the well-behaved little girl pleased her very much. She did she did her best to make Amy happy, but dear me. What mistakes she made. She worried Amy. Most death with her rules of order, her prim ways, and long prosy talk. Finding the child more docile than her sister, an old lady felt it of her duty to try to contract as far as possible the bad facts of home and freedom and industrious. She took Amy in hand and taught her as herself had been taught six, 60 years ago. She had to wash the cups every morning and polish up the old-fashioned uh, spoons and fat silver teapot and the glasses till they shone. Then she must dust the room, and what a trying job that was, not to speak, um, ex not to speck escaped in Aunt March's eyes, and all the furniture had claw legs and musk carvings, which was never dusted to suit. Then Polly must be fed, and lapdog combed, and dozen trips upstairs and down to get things or deliver orders. After these tiresome labors, she must do her lessons. Then she was allowed one hour for exercise or play, and didn't enjoy it. Lori came every day and wheedled Aunt March till Amy was allowed to go out with him. When they walked and rode and had capital time 
After dinner, she had to read aloud and sat still while the old lady slept. Then patchwork and towel towels appeared, and Amy sewed with outward meekness and inward rebel rebellion till dusk, when she was allowed to amuse herself as she liked till tea time. <sighs> if it had not been for Lori and old Esther, the mild she felt that she never could have got through the dreadful time. The cook was bad-tempered and the old coachman deaf. And the Esther, the only one who ever took any notice of the young lady. Esther was a French woman who had lived with Mad May, as she called her mistress, for many years. Her real name is Estelle, but Aunt March ordered her to change it, and she obeyed the condition that she was never asked to change her religion. She took a fancy of Ma Madame Estelle and amused her with the old stories of her life in France. She also allowed her to roam about the great house and examine the curious of pretty things. Sorrowed away in the big wardrobes and the agent chests for Aunt March, harled like a magpie, Amy's chief delighted was an Indian cabinet full of queer drawers like pigeonholes and secret places in which were kept all sorts of ornaments to examine those things. Gave Amy great satisfaction, especially the jewel cases in which on velvet uh, cushions reposed the ornaments which had adorned the bell 40 years ago, which would Madame Estelle uh, chose if she had her will, asked Est uh, Esther. I should choose this if I might, reply Amy, looking with great admiration at the string of gold and, um, and boy beads, from which hung a heavy cross of the same. I, too, covet that. It is rosary, and such I should use it like a, a good Catholic, said Esther. It is, it might to use as you, oh my God, you use the string of good smelling wooden beads hanging over your glass, said, asked Amy. Truly, yes, to pry with. You seem to take a deal of comfort in your prayers, Esther, and always come down looking quiet, satisfied. I wish I could. If Madame Estelle was a, was a Catholic, she would find true comfort. But as that is not to be, it would be well if you went apart each day to meditate and pray. As did the good mistress whom I served before. Madam, she had a little chapel and in it found solacements for much trouble. Would it be right for me to do so? Two? Oh my gosh, what the heck? asked Amy, who in her loneliness felt the need to help of some sort. It would be excellent, and I shall gladly arrange the little dressing room for you, saying nothing to Madame. But when she sleeps, go uh, go you sit alone for a while to think good thoughts and ask her dear guard to preserve her sister. Amy liked the idea and gave her leave a range of light of closet next to her room. I wish I knew where all these pretty things would go when Aunt Marches dies, she said as she slowly replaces the shining rosary and shut the jewel case one by one to you and your sisters. I know it, Madame May confided in me. I witnessed her will and it is to be so, whispered Esther. How nice. 
but I wish she'd let us have them now. Procrastination is not agreeable. It is too soon yet for you young ladies to wear these things. The first one who is effectuated with all the pearls, Madame A has said, and I have a fancy that the little turquoise ring will be given to you when you go, for Mar uh, Madame A approves your good behavior and charming matters. Do you think so? Oh, I'll be a lamb. If I can only have that lovely ring, it's ever so much prettier than Kitty Bryant's. I do like Aunt Marme, um, Aunt March, after all. And Amy tried on the blue ring with a de uh, delighted face. From that day, she was a model of obedience, and the old lady admired that the success in her training. Esther fitted up the closet with a little table, placed a footstool before it, and over and over. It a picture. It was a valued copy of one of the famous pictures of the world. And Amy Beauty loving eyes were never tired of looking up the sweet face of the defined mother while tender thoughts of her own were busy at her heart. On the table she lied her little testament and Hume book, kept a vase always full of best flowers. Lori brought her and came every day to sit alone. Thinking good thoughts and praying, praying, oh dear Lord, to pres preserve her sister. She tried to forget herself, to keep cheerful, and to be satisfied with doing right. In her first effort of being good, she decided to make her will, as Aunt March had done. It cost her a pang even to think of giving up a little treasure, which in her eyes were so precious as the old lady jewels. During one of her play hours, she wrote out a wrote out the important document, which some helped from Esther as to certain legal terms. And when the good-natured French woman had signed her name, Amy felt relieved and laid it by the show. Lori whom she wanted as a second witness, as it was rainy day. She went upstairs to amuse herself in one of those large chambers and took Polly with her and for company. In this room, there was a wardrobe full of old-fashioned costumes, and it was her favorite amusement. To worry herself in the faded pro uh, procades and parade up and down before the long mirror, making stately courtesies and sweeping her train about with a rustle which delighted her ears. So busy she was on this day that she did not hear Laurie's ring, nor see his face peeping in her as she gravely promated to and fro, flirting her fan and tossing her head on which she wore the great pink turban. She was obligated to walk carefully, for she had on high-heeled shoes. As Lori told Joe afterward, it was a commercial sight to see her mince along with Polly, brightly, just behind her, immediately, oh my gosh, immediately her as well as he could, and stopping to laugh and exclaim, Ain't we fine? Get along, you fright. Hold your tongue. Kiss me, dear. Ha ha. Having the difficulty restraining the explosion of merriment, uh, mir Lori taped and with gracefully received, sit down and rest while I put those things away. Then I want to consult you about the very serious matter, said Amy, when she sat, uh, when she had shown her splendor and driven Polly into a corner. That bird is a trail of my life, and she, and she continued removing the pink mountain from her head while Lori seated himself astride the chair. I'm writing your 
I'd wring your neck if you were mine, you old torment, cried Laurie, shaking his fist at the bird, who put his head on one side and gravely croaked, Allah, bless you, buttons, dear. Nod, I'm ready, said Amy, shutting the wardrobe and taking the paper out of her pocket. I want you to read the please and tell me if it's legal. I fear I thought ought to do it for life is uncertain. I don't want all the ill feelings over my tomb. Lori bit his lip and turning a little from pe uh, the pensive speaker, reading the following document with praise worthy gravely. My last will and testament. I, Amy Curtis March, being in my same mind to do give the bequeath all my personal property, V to wit, namely, to my father, my best picture, sketches, maps, and ar works of art, including frames. Also, my hundred dollars to do what he likes with. To my mother, all my clothes, except the blue apron with pockets. Also, my likeness and my medal with, uh, with much love. To my dear sister, Margaret, I give my turquoise ring. If I get it, also my green box with the doves on it, also my piece of real lace for her neck, and my stretch of her as the mem uh, memorial of her little girl. To Joe I leave my breast pen, one mended of sealing wax into my bronze in ink stand, she lost the curve in my precious plaster rabbit because I'm sorry I burnt up my, her story. To Beth I give my dolls and little burrow my fan, my linen collars, and my new slippers. And the herewith also leaves her my regret that I ever made fun of old Joanne. To my friend and neighbor, uh, Theodore Lawrence, I be with my paper, Marshleaf Portfolio, a portfolio, my clay model of the horse, though he did say he hadn't any neck. Also, in return for his great kindness and honor of affections, any one of my artistic works he likes, Notre Dame is the best. For our ventral B factor, Mr. Lawrence, I leave my purple box with the looking glass in the cover which will be nice for his pens and remind him of the departed girl who who thanks him for his favors to her family, especially Beth. I wish my favorite playmate, Kitty Barnt, to have the blue silk apron and my gold bead ring with a kiss. To Hannah, I give a band box. She wanted all the patchwork. I leave hoping she will remember me when it sees you. To this will and testament, I set my hand and seal on this 20th day of November, Anno Domini, 1864, Amy Curtis March. Witness, Estelle Fainer and Theodore Lawrence. What put in your head? Did anyone tell you about Beth's giving away her things? Asked Lawrence soberly. She explained and then asked anxiously, What about Beth? She felt so ill one day and she told Joe she wanted to give her piano to Meg, her bird to you, and the poor old doll to Joe. Who would love it for her sake? She was sorry she had so little to give and left locks of her hair to the rest of us and her best love to Grandpa. She never thought of a will. Lori was signing the ceiling of her spoke and did not look up till the great tear dropped on the paper. Amy's face was full of trouble, but she only said, don't people put sort of postscripts to their will sometimes? Yes, caudalicious they call them. Put one in mind then. That I wish all my curls cut off and give round to my friends. Lori added it. Smile 
at Amy's last and the greatest sacrifice. Then he amused her for an hour and was much interested in all her trails. But when he came came to go, Amy held him back to whisper with trembling lips, Is there really any danger about Beth? I'm afraid there is. But we must hope for the best, so don't cry, dear. And Lori put his arm about her with a brotherly gesture, which was very comforting. When he had gone, she went to her little chapel and prayed for Beth with streaming tears and aching heart, feeling that a million turquoise rings would not console for the loss of her gentle little sister. And that is the end of chapter 19. Thank you guys for listening.